Okay. Well, it's, it's time. So I think we'll go ahead and get started and, you know, people kind of filter in as they do. There are a couple of things I wanted to talk about before we get started. So uh, the, the first thing is um, the, the office hours. So a lot of people have signed up for that. And um, okay, that's a, that's a decent change. A lot of people have signed up for those and we just had our first office hours meeting this week. Okay, yeah, sure. Oops. Um, and I thought it was really fun. So it's, it's, a much, it's a much less formal sort of arrangement than this. It's, it's still me talking at you for the most part. I, don't, I mean, there's, there's no denying that, but um, it's more of a conversation. People ask questions and you know, we, we look kind of deeper into things and just kind of spend some time talking about this stuff. So I think it's a really good deal. Um, especially in a class of this size, if you have specific questions, it's there's not really a good time to ask. This is only supposed to be one hour and you know there, there are hundreds of people at any given time and you don't really have a great opportunity to jump in and ask a question. Another bonus feature of the office hours, which I realized sort of after the fact, I didn't actually plan it this way, but the office hours are not recorded or posted online. So that's probably, I mean, it seems like kind of a, I don't know, kind of a shady uh, patron benefit to say like, if you come at this time, I won't record you asking questions in class and put them on YouTube. Uh, but you know, that's how it ended up working out. So, so there you go. I was just about to put something else in here. Uh, so if you're interested in office hours, it's a, it's a patron benefit. Um, it was uh, Dante and my wife's idea uh, when we were sitting in a park somewhere, they they brainstormed for what sort of patron benefits I could have. And that's what they came up with. And I thought it was a good idea. So that's now a thing that exists and quite a number of you have signed up for it. The last thing I wanna say about that is uh, there are two when to meets that you got announcements about. Um, and those are for finding the best time to host the office hours. Some people are on the West coast of the US and the, uh, the afternoon time, early afternoon time in Europe is terrible for the US West Coast. Someone actually came at 5 a.m. Um, and I was quite impressed by that, but I don't want them to have to do that every single time. So I'm working on another time. People have not filled out the when to meet. So if that's something you're interested in, please go fill out the when to meet so that I can choose a time that works for everyone. And we're gonna have multiple times per week and we can have as many as we want to have, because the nice thing about office hours is that if like 100 people sign up for it, hypothetically, I won't need to um, have a day job anymore. So we could just do it all the time. So yeah, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, um, there was another thing that I wanted to put up here. It's Cherney's Etymological Dictionary. I was just going to bring this up in class to look at it. Uh, it's it's available just about everywhere online. So I was gonna put a link to it in the syllabus, but I just didn't quite have time before class started just now, but I'll, I'll put it in there. It will be there after this class for you to go look at. And as you can see, it's just a list of Coptic words with um, their likely ancient Egyptian etymologies. So I, I get this ah, ah word. This is a really common word that in the Egyptological pronunciation is ah, ah, which is you know, kind of unrealistic and really hard to remember. Um, it's two, two different signs that sound exactly the same the way we pronounce it. Uh, but then we have a Coptic descendant of it, which is II, which is quite helpful. Um, yeah, and it's just a book full of those. It's really fun to look through and it's really helpful for getting a sense of kind of the relationship between the vocalized versions of these words and what's written in the hieroglyphs. Because one of the things about hieroglyphs that is really hard to explain, especially at an introductory level, is that they, they don't directly represent the sounds of the words in, um, in a completely, I don't know what the word is, in, like a, in a very rational and predictable sort of way. They represent the spoken language in a mixture of um, 
like traditional spellings and spellings that have changed over time because of sound changes, but they haven't changed completely. So there will be multiple characters in there, but it's really just one single sound because it changed over time and they kept tweaking the spelling and it ended up as kind of a mess. And that can be really hard to get your head around. And honestly, you know, somebody could sit down and write out a list of rules, like a, like a huge sort of algorithmic explanation for how you go from a hieroglyphic spelling to a Coptic pronunciation. Um, and then they'd have to write just as many exceptions as they write for the rules. And it would just be a big messy thing and, and impossible to remember. But it's actually remarkably easy to sort of intuit by looking at lots of examples. And that's one of the things that you're going to be doing for homework. So the activity for today is to look at this Coptic text and, um, okay and then go on from there. Uh, we might get a little bit farther than that, depending on how the time works out. But I'm trying to, trying to keep these as sort of bite-sized chunks just for the sake of the video playlist and things. So we're going to be looking at the Coptic script today, and we're not actually learning Coptic in this class. If you're interested in learning Coptic, there are a lot of ways to do it. One of the possible ways is to go through the Coptic course that began about a year ago and ended uh, just over a month ago. And that's in another playlist on my YouTube channel. So you can very easily find that. It follows along with the exercises in Lambden's Introduction to Sayyidic Coptic. So if you want to learn a bit about Coptic language, it is extraordinarily helpful. In fact, originally um, I planned this class to be a continuation of the Coptic course. And I wanted to make it, I wanted to make Coptic a prerequisite for this class because that's that's how useful it is. Um, but then I realized no one's ever really going to study Egyptian if they have to study this random language that they've never heard of first. Um, so that's just going to create kind of an arbitrary barrier to entry that I, I don't really want. Um, so I, I decided to open this up to everyone, but Coptic is still a very important part of it. And the more you know about Coptic, the more it can help you. So that's a very useful thing to learn. And all the resources are there. And of course, there's plenty of stuff on the Discord. Most of the people who went all the way through the, the Coptic course are on Discord and will happily discuss these things with you. And um, so you have a lot of resources if you want to learn that. Uh, Ralph, thank you for this point. I, I forgot to mention that uh, in, in talking about the hieroglyphs and weird traditional spelling and all these things, uh, he wrote, sounds like English spelling. And that's very true. I think that's the example I used in the office hours the other day. It's very much like English spelling where you have these um, seemingly arbitrary sequences of letters that correspond to certain sound sequences. And they're actually quite reliable and not that hard to figure out, but you kind of have to learn them from just seeing enough examples. It would be really hard to sit down and explain how they all work. And it wouldn't be terribly useful because you couldn't remember all of them anyway. Um, so that's, that's the reason that we spend a fair bit of time looking at Coptic in this class. Again, it's not a class to teach you Coptic, but you can learn to read the Coptic alphabet. And the thing about alphabets is that they are, they are one of the funnest things you can ever sit down and learn as a foreign alphabet, especially one that's truly alphabetic, like there are only 20 some odd characters that correspond to sounds because it, it looks totally bewildering. Like I'm sure, you know, the first time you look at something like this, uh, it, you know, it could be some totally alien language. Um, but then after about an hour of effort, uh, it, it becomes totally intuitive and you, you tend to forget there was even a time when you couldn't read this. And that's, that's how it is for me now. This is just as easy to read as, as the English on the other side. Um, and that is really just a function of time. So if you're the sort of person that likes doing language type puzzles, uh, this one right here is one of my all time favorites. I've done this for, I don't know how many scripts, just take uh, the first chapter of Matthew, uh, which of course has been translated to just about every language and script you can possibly think of, just take that, put them side by side and use the names to figure out the script. So that's what I'm asking you to do here. Um, it doesn't take that long to recognize that, you know, this is Isaac. There's quite a few clues that can help you um, figure that out. 
but even in a in this case you know there's an i and then there's what looks like a c and some a type things and then a k and it's pretty easy to figure out that that's isaac um, even in scripts that are totally unlike the uh the latin alphabet it's still it's it's really fast you can figure a lot of things out that way and i personally find that this exercise of using a sort of a puzzle to solve things um, makes it very easy to learn. Like they will, these these letter values will will stick in your mind much more easily by working through an example like this than they would if you were to just you know find a website that shows you all the letter values and, and try to learn them from that. Um, so that's what we've been doing. That was the that was the homework anyway. And the the task here, I can get all my zoom stuff out of the way the task is to fill these things in so i will call on volunteers and um i'll probably break this up into a few people so uh last time i called on volunteers and then uh rosetta very very helpfully um gave us all the answers because i didn't want to switch to anyone else because she was doing such a good job but this time i think i'm going to actually hold myself to my intentions to switch between people. So do I have a first volunteer? I'll give you say um, the first five letters. Anyone wanna tell me these first five letters? I see a hand up, Kevin? Yeah, I can do. Okay. All right, um, the first one is ah, yep. um, attested to an Abraham. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is B. Also from Abraham? Yeah. Um, um, I'll, I'll tell you a fun thing about this. It's actually either V or W. It just looks really? like B. Yeah, but it is uh, based on what you have. Uh, yeah, it, it's the B character. All right. And, it's, and it can be pronounced as a W? It can. Yeah. Um, okay. the modern, in the modern Coptic church, it's pronounced almost exclusively as a W, but uh, earlier on, it could be either a V or a W, based on earlier Coptic evidence. It was in almost... From, the, sorry, and from what I saw, it's also possible it was a bilabial fricative, voiced bilabial fricative. Wow. Yeah, this one. That's, that's possible as well. And it's, it's quite likely that it had uh, multiple allophones, uh, a bilabial, voiced bilabial fricative, um, voiced labiodental fricative, or the labiovelar. Uh, so any of those sounds. So the, the IPA symbol uh, beta is, is also one of the possibilities. Yeah. All right, uh, the next one looks like an R. Um, and I have not found it attested, but I know that it's a G. Is it, I not it in the, is it not in the it's example? Not, I didn't find it any of the, in any of the names. I couldn't find it. It's gonna cheat and see. Uh, this is what I this is what I asked you not to do. Does it not actually? Oh, I should have written <laughs> it as one of the answers. Uh, that's my mistake. Then I thought I had written all of the ones that don't actually appear. I thought I had filled them in, but uh, I just missed that one. Yeah, that should actually be. That should be written in here already. But yeah, it's basically a G. OK, uh, the next one is a D, and it's attested Sorry. to in Judas and David. Yep. Um, next one is uh, Epsilon, and it's pronounced E, and it's uh, Ezekias and Estrom. It's the first letter of those names. Yeah, very good. Um, Something kind of interesting about this one, it is, uh, it is the letter that we would transcribe with epsilon, the e eh sound, as in the English word bed. Um, and it is also in, in a lot of the evidence we have, especially um, Arabic texts written in the Coptic script, it's very clearly also the letter that would be written with ash, so an a eh type sound, as in the word ant. It can also represent that sort of sound. So it's some sort of uh, high front vowel, um uh it has a lot of allophones it is i think it's far and away the most common vowel in coptic texts uh, and it it tends to represent sort of a spread of different 
vowel sounds. You'll see a lot more about epsilon um, as you see more and more examples of Coptic words because it, it has a really interesting sort of complicated role to play in terms of reconstructing the sounds of earlier Egyptian. Basically, many things turn into epsilon in Coptic. So um, things like an unstressed A type vowel, I'm sorry, not unstressed, a, a short, a stressed A type vowel in closed syllable turns into epsilon. That's the only example that, that pops into my head. I'll have to look at a bunch of examples and, and then I'll tell you. But basically a bunch of things become Coptic epsilon. So it's kind of like a catch-all letter. If you see an epsilon in a Coptic word, it's kind of hard to say what the original vowel was, but then there, there are ways of figuring that out. So it's, it's kind of an interesting situation. Um, what is happening? I'm getting some kind of alert. Oh, great. Thanks, thanks Google. Um, okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Do I have a volunteer for another set of letters? Peter, how many do you want to do, Peter? I mean, I can give you the standard uh, five. Yeah, let's do the five. All right, let's do the five. Okay, so I think that's a Z sound. I can't tell you the name of the letter. Uh, it is a Zeta, and it is it is actually a oh. DZ type sound, but but yeah, a Z type sound. Okay, that's an Ada. The H looking thing is an Ada. Uh, makes the E sound. Yeah, it makes, um, in IPA, we would write this sound like this. Um, I've done some, some research to, to argue that it very definitely does make an A type sound. Uh, for whatever oh, wow. reason, Ada is the most disagreed about Coptic letter in the whole alphabet. <laughs> People love to come up with, um, Ada is kind of just the, the um, like the all sorts of Egyptian phonology. Everybody likes to just pile whatever funny ideas they have into it. Uh, but it, it was very likely just an A sound. Um, so like the sound in the English word day. Um, and it looks like an oh, H. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. That's very confusing. Um, this is one of the ones that I have to highlight for you because in the Coptic class, this is the one that threw people off for a very long time. Looks like an H. Peter, you know, you're in the Coptic class. Looks like an H. Yep. Sounds like a vowel. It's super confusing. Um, don't feel frustrated if you get it wrong. In Greek, a bunch of times. in Greek, doesn't it look like an interesting lowercase n? This kind that, of thing? Right? Or am I? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Or am I wrong about that? Yeah. Okay. In the modern, the modern writing, it looks like that, but in ancient onshell, which was the writing from the past, it looked exactly like this, especially yeah. if it was a bouquet. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Theta. Theta. And iota. So I think that's a TH and then an I for iota. Yeah. And then a kappa would be K. That's right. So those are all correct. Uh, this, this one we have to talk about a little bit because yes, it's a TH, but what do you mean TH? Mm, yeah. So given the examples, let me see. Oh man, there's an example I always of. used in Coptic class. That's kind of rude, but I'm going to use it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't remember the example from Coptic class. But, uh... It was this one. I said something about how, like, anytime oh. I see that word written, <laughs> I always read it in my head as shifid. <laughs> read it as <laughs> every single time. And then I have to go back and be like, no, uh, it does not say shifid. <laughs> um, so, so theta in Coptic is like these, this th, it's literally t plus h. It is an aspirated okay. t sound. So if we're going to write it in IPA, we would write it like this. Um, T okay. plus a little superscript H, because it is literally T and H 
it is not the, the English uh, digraph that actually represents, confusingly, the IP later, IPA letter that's written like this, uh, which is a IP. Um, interdental fricative, the th sound, completely yeah. different sound from the t sound. So there you go. Okay, so if I were to replicate that myself, the t, the the correct example would be t. <laughs> well, it, we actually have it at the end of that t. Uh, we have it in English. So if you pronounce these two words, top and stop, uh, okay. this top is an aspirated t. This is an unaspirated t. Okay. Okay. So pronounce it like the t in top and not like the t in stop. So this is just and um, also sorry, and also in the British pronunciation, take take it's an oh aspirated. yeah, a lot okay. of a lot of differences between British and American English come down to the choice of an aspirated t versus a like a flap type sound or even an unreleased T. So if you think about um, the way T's sound in British English, you're probably thinking of an aspirated T. That's the, that's the, hmm. the distinction that makes the difference in dialect marked to our ears. Okay, yeah. well, one other question about British English. Sorry to get us off topic. Uh, whenever I hear someone in England pronounce Linda, the A at the end appears to my ears to have an R attached to it of uh, yeah. some form. Is that correct? Is that your experience? That or is that my experience. Being weird. No, my, my favorite example is um, I, ha I had an Australian friend once who really liked to eat what I thought was tuna. And um, <laughs> I was like, she said something about like tuna sandwiches. And I was like, tuna sandwiches? And you can probably guess where this is going. Oh, yeah, tuna, yeah, okay. So um, dialects yeah. of English that are non-rhotic, so dialects that tend to delete syllable final Rs, um, they, uh, yeah, as, as Christian just said, they, the, they put the R back in before a following vowel. So often oh. at the ends of words, an R will appear um, sort of intermittently based on the sound of the following word not based on the way the word is spelled. So yeah, that's, that's oh, okay. Okay. It's an entirely uh, valid experience that the phenomenon you're noticing is entirely real. And it has to do with this, um, this thing called roticity. So um, I'm just gonna put these dividing lines back in to keep track of what we've done. Um, so American English is highly rhotic, uh, everything except for like a really hardcore Boston accent. The R's are always going to be pronounced more or less the same way. Um, they're they're mm. phonetically quite similar to one another. Um, you know, that gets complicated, of course, like everything with language, but they're pretty much just always there. Um, in non-rhotic mm. dialects, syllable final R's are dropped in some way. Uh, normally, it's, it results in the lengthening of the previous vowel. So there's this famous example of like, you can't pak ya ka and havad yad, that, 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 <laughs> that old, right. old kanad. Um, yeah. People love that awesome. one and I love it. I love it. It's, it's so obnoxious, <laughs> but it's delightful. Um, so like, why are those R's being deleted? Uh -huh. Pak ya ka. Um, they're all syllable final R's every single time. I see. Um, and that's, that's a characteristic of the, you know, the stereotypical Boston accent is deleting those syllable final R's. That's also, um, a really, really important factor in the development of Egyptian phonology. So once we start looking at Coptic mm. words, and once you start looking at, mm -hmm. um, hieroglyphic words with the Coptic word beside it, you will have to keep this mm -hmm. phenomenon in mind. And you can even if it helps, you can imagine that that silly phrase in a in a Boston accent. Um, I'm sure all the people who who know me and, and live in Providence are just like horrified by my terrible attempt to do that accent. But um, okay, come back to that question. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 useful to remember. You'll see examples like uh, this Coptic example, Nuta corresponds to the earlier Egyptian Necher, and there's 
Yeah. Several things that happened here. So I'll just break down this one example to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking for. Um, this U vowel comes from an A type vowel that it's a, it's a stressed A vowel, an open syllable that becomes a long O sound representing Coptic by omega. And then after a um, nasal, so because it begins with N, that becomes an O oh. sound. So that's where that vowel comes from. Mm. The, okay. uh, the, the second T just becomes a first T. So this is really something kind of like netter once we get to late Egyptian. Uh -huh. And then uh -huh. you would expect an R here, but it's dropped right. just like in the Pakyaka oh. example. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Cool. So all of that is going on. Um, it's a lot to try to memorize, but it's actually quite easy to um, internalize intuitively once you see enough examples. You'll see something like Nuda, and you'll guess that it came from an earlier Egyptian N, some kind of T, and then either a final T or an R, and then it had an A type vowel and an I type vowel, and this vowel was stressed. And you'll be able to do all of that just by looking at the Coptic word. So yeah, that's kind of what we're going for. Cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there be awesome. someday. Um, <laughs> not, not too far away either. Those uh, those vocabulary exercises are the homework for, for next time. Yeah. Um, and we'll, if, if all of this is going way too fast because we haven't even finished talking about the Coptic letters and I'm already like deriving examples using the Coptic alphabet, uh, don't fret because uh, we'll, we'll talk about it all again a lot. Uh, it's kind of what I did. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, I saw another hand up. I have to get the participant screen again. Sorry, I'm not good with the Zoom. Um, Manuel, do you want to do the next group? Yep. Did you have your hand so up about something else? I. No, no. OK. The first one is Lola. It makes the end sound. That's right. The next one is May, and it makes the M sound. Yep. The following one is N, it's Nay, and it makes the N sound. That's right. The and then this one, one is I've... O. Okay. It's C. The next one is P, and it makes a P sound if following the recreated pronunciation, but it's D in yeah. the Arabo-Borite pronunciation. Yeah, exactly. So this is um, this is actually more of a B. It's actually so you know we look at beta, and it it looks like a B in any like. Latin script, so we assume that it's a B, but in fact, it's really a, you know, a V or a W sound. And this is what actually makes the B sound, as you just noted. So it is either an unaspirated P sound, which to um, American English speakers sounds exactly the same as the letter B, we can't really hear the difference, um, or it's just a B sound. And we actually see it being used as the, as the equivalent of um, you know, this Arabic letter. Um, yeah. yeah, whatever. I think it's ba. Ba. Yeah, I only learned the way that um, that Egyptian says them, and then I just mix them all together with like the Hebrew names and all all of the all this ba. Yes, or or ba, depending on which sort of Arabic you're using. Um, okay. Excellent job, Emmanuel. Uh, one uh, minor note here. This is the short O sound. Um, and there's reason to believe that it was probably something like the aw, as in English, um, caught, I suppose, um, rather than an O, rather than a true O. But jury's still out on that one. It's definitely the short O. It's called Omicron in Greek. and. Uh, and this one over here is called omega. So I'll just write this out. Omega and omicron. Once you analyze those, you can see that it's just little o, big o. Omicron, omega. So, well, I spelled that, I spelled that horribly, but you get the idea. It's like the micro o versus the mega o. 
So this is the short O sound. And in Coptic, it probably had a slight difference in quality. So omega is probably a true O and omicron is probably an aw type sound. Okay, um, I think that about covers it there. How about the next group of this many? Six, who wants to do six? JJ. Okay, can everyone hear me? Just fine. Okay, so the first one is Ro. Mm -hmm. which is an R sound. That's right. Um, worth making special note of because everybody also struggles with that one for a long time. It's all the letters that look like a letter you already know, but sound totally different. Those really throw people off for quite a long time. This is an R. It is not a P, even though it looks like a P. I'm sorry, I didn't make the alphabets this way, but yeah. <clears throat> So um, the next one is Sigma, I believe, and it's an S sound. That's right. Um, looks like a C, sounds like an S, so it's not that hard to remember, um, but people do sometimes struggle with that too. Um, a lot of people will occasionally pronounce it as a, like a K type sound because the English letter C can represent a K or a S type sound. But yeah, it's just an S and it's called Sima in Coptic. Um, the, the, the ig of sigma seems to not be pronounced. Oh, nice, that's good to know. Um, the, the next one is tau, and it's mm -hmm. um, it's a T sound, a short T. Yeah, it's an unaspirated T. So just as in the case of, of P and another one K, um, we can pull all three of these um, voiceless stop sounds aside and note that they are specifically unaspirated, right? So I gave you the example before of top and stop. Uh, tau is the sound in stop and theta is the sound in top. So in English, we think of those as being the same sound, but they're actually slightly different. They're allophones of a single phoneme. So they're, they're uh, slight variations on uh, what we conceptualize as being one single sound and their variation is totally predictable in English phonology. Well, in Coptic, they're distinct. So um, yeah, aspirated T versus unaspirated T. Okay, so the next one is Upsilon. Mm -hmm. And if I believe it can have a variety of sounds, an U uh, like a U or an I like an English I. Yep. And it's, um, I think it's in a few diphthongs that make some other sounds perhaps. Yeah, in diphthongs like um, owl, it's distinctly a W type sound. I would write this phonetically like this, owl, or, or even uh, owl. It's one of those type of things. So there it's truly a W. When you see it in Coptic words, it's almost always an I type sound. So that, that sound was a high central vowel and it can kind of go either direction. It can go back and make more of an uh type sound, or it can go forward and make more of an i uh type sound. Uh, in spoken Greek, it drifted forward and became the i uh or e uh type sound everywhere. And Coptic spelling often reflects that. So you'll see the epsilon used um, in place of an eta or an, uh, a yoda in other words. So yeah, it's kind of tricky, but it, yeah. you don't see it that often. So yeah. Good. Uh -huh. The next one is phi, and it's like a English F or PH sound. Yeah. Um, in all the examples we're going to be looking at, it's definitely a PH sound. And um, I need a good, I need a good rude example that will help you remember that it's truly P and H and not just not like it's not like in telephone. It's like in hip hop. That's the example I came up with. I came up with hip hop. And you know what? It's a good example. Um, yeah, it's this pH, P plus H. And just like in this example here, where we have top and stop, we can give uh, pot and spot. Um, phi is this sound in pot, and pi is this sound in spot. So like an aspirated pot. Exactly, it is an aspirated puh. 
So we would write it in IPA probably with the little superscript H. Okay. And so finally, um, Kai, mm -hmm. and this is sort of like a, um, like a, I forget the the way you explain it, but it's almost like a ch in the back of the mouth, like sound or um, kh. It is a kh. Yeah. Uh, at first, I thought you were describing um, something like a velar fricative, like a ha huh sound. Um, in this case, it, it really isn't. Uh, it is that in in Greek, but in Coptic, it is distinctly aspirated K. So again, we have another one of these pairs. I'm running out of space on the screen because I didn't use my space wisely. Um, but we can make another. Um, we can make another example. I got to think of one. Um, how about Kit and Skit? Those both have Ks in them. Uh, so this would be Coptic Chi, and this would be Coptic Kappa. Skit, Kit, yeah. Uh, so this one is aspirated, and this one uh, is not aspirated in English. And that's the distinction between those two. So it is truly K-H. Um, trying to think of an example word. Got to think of something as good as shithead or hip hop. Mm. I think you just got one. What is it? On the comments. Um, someone oh, left you a comment on chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, commenters. <laughs> I have an example that is more, more appropriate for class. In, Brit, in British English, it's the C in K is aspirated. K. Oh, in K. Yeah, that's a good example. Not not quite as memorable, I think, as the word dickhead. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, I mean, there's a reason I don't mark my YouTube videos as meant for children every time that question is asked. Uh, it will help <laughs> you remember. You know, you're not going to forget it now. Uh, it's like this K sound. Uh, it is truly K plus H. You would not pronounce this word dickhead with a velar fricative, um, it would sound totally insane. So there you go. Um, okay. Perfect, yeah. that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, I kind of want to get one with P plus H that has the word head in it now, but it's, it, you know, let's not go down that road. It's going to get, it's just going to get worse. Okay, <laughs> so, um, uh, so we've got this far, this one is C, and it's truly P plus S. So uh, this is where we get English words like uh, psychology has that P S on the front because it truly is uh, P and S together. Um, in, in Coptic, you get it in words like um, cis, which means uh, nine, it's the number nine. And uh, in earlier Egyptian, it is pesaj. So the, this P and S have actually been written in Coptic with the C letter. So that's kind of neat, um, you know, still getting used. Let's see, we have another set. I've already given you a hint about what this one sounds like. How many do we have left? It looks like we have just five free spaces left. So I think that's one person. Um, oh, uh, by the way, thank you, JJ, for your excellent answers. And uh, we, need one more, we need one more volunteer. If I can repeat, I can be the volunteer. You, you can, sure. The next is the letter O. It makes mm -hmm. the long O sound. Yeah, and truly an O, whereas this one is probably more of an A type sound. So um, the next is hope high. Versus pop. Yeah, high. And this is the, the IPA. The, the letter in IPA is just an X, but it means a velar fricative. So it's it's like a K sound. It's a, it's a sound made in, in the back of your mouth by actually like bringing your tongue against uh, the velum, which is the, the soft palate at the back of your mouth, but then you don't quite 
reach all the way. Whereas in the letter K, your tongue actually touches the roof of your mouth. In the letter Hi, uh, your tongue just kind of approaches the roof of your mouth, but doesn't quite touch it. Um, the example I love to use is this name, um, which in American English is pronounced Bach by just about everyone, unless they're trying to sound fancy, in which case they say Bach and actually pronounce it with a velar fricative. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's a perfect example for speakers of American English, because you've definitely, at least once in your life, rolled your eyes at someone saying uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. So there you go. Easy to remember. Or, or words like law. You know, there's quite a few. In fact, um, the word that we often write like this, ugh, that has a velar fricative in it. Um, it's not really a, a standard English word, but it has the right sound. So yeah. The next one is hori. Hori. It makes the yeah. H sound. Yeah. There's a lot of disagreement about whether this is a pharyngeal or a glottal H. So whether it's like the English H in words like, you know, hope, your, your average English H sound, or whether it's like the, um, it's called the, often oh. called the emphatic H or the, the, the pharyngeal H in, um, in things like Ahmed, the name. So that, that has a different sort of H. It's very likely that it is the glottal H in Coptic. So it's probably just like the English sound and you can pronounce it that way. Um, look at the chat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you in the chat for the for the Arabic letter ha. Um, but yeah, it's probably he or English H. Okay. And then two more, two really tricky ones. Emmanuel, are you sure you're up for these ones? Okay, yeah. what you got? The first one may make the sound of a long E, E, mm -hmm. O, A, Y. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the two choices. So it can be an E sound, as in the verb E to come, or it can be a Y sound, as in the word. Gotta think of an example. Oh, good. This one. Yet off. Nile. Um, there it makes a Y sound. This is pronounced. Yet off. Uh, stress is here. And then this word is just, just E. Um, that one's really tricky because um, just about everyone spends a lot of time being confused about it when reading Coptic. I have Coptic students who still routinely pronounce it as either A or as I, presumably based on the, uh, the German spelling, E plus I makes an I sound. Uh, it's just E. It really doesn't need to be two letters. In just about every single case, you could replace it with a single Yoda and nothing would change. And Coptic. Interestingly enough, I would like to add that this combination of epsilon plus yota was used also in ancient Greek, even in the classical times, for e or y in the middle of sentences. So it's an interesting thing to know. Yeah, it's, being, it's definitely being borrowed from Greek, Greek orthography, for sure. The next is O, O, and Epsilon, mm -hmm. which makes the sound of U or W. Yeah. U or W. Great. Yeah. U or W. Um, so in a word like U, uh, that means what? Uh, it just sounds like U. And in a word like, got to think of a word, uh, Wa'av, that means holy. Um, it sounds like W, and this word is actually pronounced wa. Christian, there is a question I would like to ask. Yeah. We have an additional letter in Coptic, the soul. It was presumably, uh, presumably was the addition of the gamma, which was a letter of the very ancient Greek, Homeric mm -hmm. Greek. I would like to know why it was added just as a number instead of adding as a constant as well, since it made the W sound. Uh, that's not a question that I'm in a great position to answer. So you're talking about this thing, uh, which yes. is usually called stigma in, in later times, but it does come from, you know, this, the, uh, the yeah. Yes. 
the die gamma. Um, so this was originally a W type sound. It's not really used in classical Greek, uh, but it is preserved as the numeral for six. So um, just a bit of background on that. Coptic writes and Greek write numerals using letters, kind of like Roman numerals. So it goes one, two, three, four, five. Uh, six is not actually in the alphabet. It uses this digamma character that kind of looks like this uh, called stigma, seven, eight, nine, 10, 20, 30, 40. And I'll, I'll stop there, but it goes on. Um, all of the, um, all of the ones places, the multiples of tens, the multiples of 100, all have Greek letters representing them. It works a lot like Roman numerals, a um, little bit different, but basically the same principle. It's not purely a positional um, numbering system, but it's, it's pretty close. Uh, so why is stigma preserved for six? I really don't know. Uh, that's a Greek thing. So it got preserved for six in Greek and then Coptic just borrowed that. Uh, so that that's a question that would would go back to the history of the of the Greek alphabet in a Greek context, which I honestly don't know that much about. But it's a good question. Um, yeah, I suggest ask ask elsewhere. Um, I'm sure somebody knows the entire history of that, and I'd be quite interested to know myself. Um, okay, so there's a question in the chat from Imen. Can you explain the relationship to Egyptian? As in Itru, is it Iteru, Itereu? or yetero. Some, Egypt, some Egyptologists pronounce the J as E, the J or I as Y, and it confuses me. Well, it is confusing because there's not really a right answer. So you're talking about, um, you're talking about this Egyptian word. Uh, I'm just gonna draw a bunch of waters. There we go. Sorry, my waters are not so good. Uh, this word that means river. Uh, and we transcribe it e true. Um, the Coptic uh, correspondent of this is the word yor. Uh, we know that the t was lost very early on, and then the final r is actually preserved because it probably had a vowel at the end that protected the r from being lost because it wasn't actually syllable final, as in the example of nuta. Um, it's 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 syllable initial, and then there's a final vowel that was subsequently lost. So we get most of the things here. This is a, a Y type sound that's here. Uh, the T is lost, and then uh, the R remains here. And then the W, final W, probably represents some kind of little short vowel, like whatever, a little schwa type thing. We don't know for sure exactly what it was, but that protected the R from being lost at the end of the word. Um, so this right here says your, that's what it's writing. Um, and it's got a few extra hieroglyphs in there and it's got the, uh, the, the watery thing classifier and all of that business, but um, it is spelling that word. So when Egyptologists say Ichiru, should they say Yeteru or Ichiru? Well, it kind of doesn't matter because they're both wrong. Um, Ichiru is just literally a way of vocalizing the transcription of the hieroglyphs. It has no relationship to the actual phonology of the word. This is a case where we know quite well what the phonology of the word was. And really at just about any given time, I can tell you what it would have sounded like at that time based on the way it's written. And it never sounded like Ichiru or Yeteru. Uh, those are both fake. That's just Egyptological pronunciation. It's just a scholarly convention that we use for the sake of convenience so that we can discuss these things in English. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a great question. I How think- the uh, second part? Mm. That's the second part of the question. The, they said that it confuses them when they pronounce J as year. This happens because the original sound of the J, which was the Yota in Latin, was year. It was through palatalization that it becomes je and then je. So yeah, the original sound is je and the German I write in using je. Right. Just yeah, that. Thing I wanted to ask. No, it's a good point. So the, the like the English pronunciation of the letter J as in a word like judge, um, that's a later phenomenon. It was originally a ya type sound. Um, definitely. Okay, and then um, another question 
what are the sounds of dy and ky exactly? So you can see these here. Um, I've, I've written them as dy and ky. Uh, these are palatals, so uh, you might write it like this, palatalized. Um, or you might write it as this IPA symbol. It's like a little J with no dot and a horizontal line through it. Uh, that's a palatalized stop. So something like K. Um, we know that it was that in earlier Egyptian. Um, this letter, uh, Janja is today pronounced as like the, as the J in the English word judge. So it's actually IPA this sound. Um, and I've just written something arguing that in fact, these are allophones in uh, medieval Coptic, that in fact, it represented there's, both of those sounds. There's a funny thing I found in modern spoken Coptic from the Cyrillic pronunciation users and the common Arab Buharic pronunciation is that they usually pronounce Janja as Janja, je. Mm. With the Cyrillic pronouncing it as G before Alpha, Omicron, and Omega, and J elsewhere. Yeah. And, and the Arab Boharic uses J. So I, it I makes think me feel that, that J, J and J are seen by then as allophones. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening. So there's probably. Uh, a case of complementary distribution where you have something uh, very like a G sound before back vowels, and it was probably actually this sound. And then you have something uh, like this before front vowels. So, um, so yeah, modern Coptic is kind of picking that up. It's picking up uh, this thing and, and turning it into this thing. Again, I didn't plan my board usage very well, um, but we can imagine a case where you have uh, these two sounds as allophones of a single phoneme that I'll just write as Janja for now. And then later on, uh, this drifts to be more sort of like a G, and then this softens to be more like a J sound. And I think that's what's happened um, in, uh, in, in modern Coptic pronunciation. There's just been a slight slight phonetic drift there, but it does reflect the original like allophonic character of this letter. Uh, Janja is also one of those Coptic letters that people love to argue about. And I myself have, have written things arguing about it, so I can't judge. Um, something else in the chat. Wonderful to get answers in clear IPA for once. Yeah, I hope you guys like that. Uh, I write things in IPA a lot. IPA is is easier for me. It's definitely harder for some people. If you don't know IPA, uh, I'll just write this on here. Um, I, I thought about this last time, actually. I, I realized I needed intentional. Wow. I realized I needed to actually say something about IPA and what I'm doing here. Uh, this is the International Phonetic Alphabet. It's rather easy to learn because you can find tons of things online that will just be um, like samples of an English text written in IPA, and you can kind of read it aloud to yourself, you know, learn the letters and uh, kind of listen to it. A lot of them are in British English for some reason, but those are, those are quite fun, especially for me as, as a speaker of American English. I read them aloud and it sounds like I'm doing a really terrible British accent. And, um, and then it, you know, it's, it's enjoyable anyway. So give that a try. Uh, learn the IPA if you can. If you don't know the IPA, uh, hopefully me saying these things out loud will, will kind of, you'll, you'll pick it up as we go. Um, so it's not a requirement, but if that's something you're interested in, it might help. Um, and there's something else about uh, Alan transliterates reed leaves as J while Hulk uses I. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a whole big topic. I once asked um, Alan why he chose to use the J rather than the I. Um, and it's, it's actually not just an I, it's an I with a little cup that's sort of representing the phonetic history of this sound in Egyptian. It's a, it's a yod type sound, like a w English Y in yes, or it's a glottal, glottal stop type sound as in the English word, uh-oh. 
um, and it, it changes over time. So this Egyptological symbol kind of represents that history. I asked him why he used J and uh, he didn't he didn't know. I think he doesn't remember <laughs> why he used J. So uh, all of Alan's books use J to transcribe this letter. Hoax and a bunch of other books use I with a cup above it. They mean the same thing. I wouldn't fret too much about those. Uh, the last thing is, is this letter. This is the, so uh, Chima or Kima is the voiceless equivalent of Janja or Ganja. And same thing applies. Everything I just said for Janja probably applies uh, for Chima, it's now pronounced um, as this IPA sound or like CH in an English word like church, um, or it is pronounced as this IPA symbol, which you can approximate by palatalizing a K. So Kya type sound, KY. Um, a lot of people, what they thought is that in modern Arabic, Arabable hierarchy pronunciation, sh is becoming sh, approximating yeah. it to, to, to she, ah, I forgot the name, <laughs> the yeah. sh sound. Yeah. But I've seen that they seem to pronounce more like the sh, sh from Russian, it's a really Interesting stuff. Okay, so um, that's a rather thorough overview. Wait, what does he say? <laughs> J has a similar ambiguity in Northern European languages and is much easier to type. So maybe that's why Alan uses J. I remember asking about it once and um, he did this thing that he does when he's like not that interested. He just goes like, hmm. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's how he responded to that question. So I was like, eh, he doesn't even remember and it doesn't matter. I can ask him again, I guess. Um, anyway, so I put this part in there uh, so we can fill it out, um, write the complete Coptic alphabet together. I put these two columns here for a reason and now I seem to be forgetting why I put them there. I was gonna put the sounds and then the names of the letters. So this is this, let me get my IPA keyboard because I'm probably gonna end up needing it. Um, v or W, let's make this bigger. Um, this, this is a tricky one, uh, but it is probably this sound. Uh, it is probably a voiced velar fricative as in ugh. So um, uh, like, like in, Oh my gosh, I'm so bad at Arabic keyboard. Uh, this, nope, this sound, probably that sound. Um, Delta two, uh, maybe a D or uh, maybe this sound as an F, so a th type sound. Uh, epsilon, probably epsilon or, um, wait, wrong one, sorry, or ash. Uh, this probably DZ, it probably has an affricate quality. Uh, there's quite good evidence for that. Ada, definitely just A. Again, it's debated, but very likely to be A. Uh, theta, uh, aspirated T. Yoda, I, or, uh, or the consonantal Y sound as in the English word, yes. K, unaspirated K sound. Uh, I think there's an IPA symbol that is specifically unaspirated, but I'm just writing it by leaving the little superscript H off because I don't remember how to write that sign. Uh, lambda is just the L. Uh, M is just M. Um, me or Mu is just M. Uh, me or Nu is just N. Uh, this KS, just like the English letter X. Uh, Omicron, probably, oops. I never remember all these. Probably the A in, in words like caught. Uh, this one, unaspirated P, R, probably realized, which one is it? No? Yeah, probably realized as a, as a tap or a trill. Uh, Sima is S, I forgot to say this is Rho, sorry. Rho as some kind of R, Sima as S, Tau as an unaspirated T. Uh, Ypsilon, either a, which one is it? Either this, probably originally this, and then, um, becoming either E or U, uh, short vowels. This one, aspirated P, it's called phi or P. Uh, this one is called key, 
or he, and it's an aspirated K. So K plus H, as in Christian's lovely example. Um, C is just P plus S together. Omega is a long O and probably a true O type sound. Shy is this letter, uh, the long S or esh letter. Uh, it's the equivalent of the English SH. So as, as in words like, uh, you know, she sells seashells, that kind of S. Phi is an F. Um, it might be, nope, which one is it? Oh, no, it's, oh, it's in a different place. Oh, I don't remember this one. Shoot. Uh, how do I get that? The fee sound, the, the IPA fee sound. How do I write it? I don't remember. Um, that's obviously not right. Oh, maybe it's with F. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, that one. I eventually found it. It just took me a minute. Um, I'm using this really awesome, uh, I think it's from Dulos, the IPA keyboard. It's so great. Uh, but then I forget how to type all the things and I have to remember them on the fly and it's not that, not that impressive to watch. Anyway, uh, nope, nope, that one, okay. So not the pharyngeal. We now have really solid evidence that it's not the, not the pharyngeal, unfortunately. Although you, you can still pronounce it that way if you want to, because I, I personally think it sounds better. Uh, probably this or uh, this. This one is IPA that or this. This one, uh, not totally clear, but it's probably just T. It's probably just, just like the English letter X represents K plus S, uh, the Coptic letter T probably just represents TI. And we have plenty of examples of them uh, writing things like, um, I think of a feminine word that has, mm, like they'll often write uh, two dia. Oh, Aurelia, what did you have? I was thinking of Tirere, peace. Oh, if yeah. You... Have I spelled it correctly? I hope so. Tirene? Wrong guy to ask, but no, it looks good. Let's, let's yeah, go with it. It looks, looks pretty good. <laughs> so you'll see a lot of times in Coptic, like the Judea or the peace. Um, these words without the article would be, you know, Udaya. With a, with a Yoda. So this probably just represents T and I, uh, and we see variant spellings that suggest that. Kind of a weird, kind of weird that they have a letter that's just T and I together, but it's kind of just like an accident of history. Uh, this is either E or J, and notice that it's just like this one. Not being very consistent in my notation, but there we go. It's just E or J. And then this one is just O or W, uh, very, very reliably. So yeah, so that's all of them. I guess I should write the names of the letters in here too. Um, wait, why am I writing in Arabic? Sorry, I'm in the wrong keyboard. Alpha, uh, theta, comma, delta, Epsilon, uh, Zeta, I really want to write it like this, Zeta, but I guess I could just write Zeta, close enough, uh, Eta, Theta, oh, I'm being inconsistent with that too, sorry, uh, sounds like an American English D sound, uh, Yoda, mm, I really want to write it like that. Oh well, kappa, lambda or lambda, which whichever one you want, uh, mu or mi, nu or ni. Again, that's that upsilon shift uh, xi, omicron, um, p, b, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, rho. It's normally written with an h because of the Greek pronunciation of that letter. Uh, in Coptic, again, it was either a trill or a flap. Uh, Sima, tau, tav, uh, ypsilon, or upsilon, whichever one you prefer. Um, P, Q, 
key C omega, how to write this, chi, I guess, chi phi hi. I'm going to write it like that. You know what I mean with that KH. Uh, this is just kind of a standard way of representing that velar fricative in English. It's, it's unfortunate, but that's what we have. Um, Janja, hmm. I'm just going to write it like that. Janja, Chima, T. Um, and yeah, those don't really have names. So there you go. That's the Coptic alphabet. And then just as a quick preview of what we're going to do next time, I haven't already put it in here, but oh wait. Yes, I did. Oh, way to go, me. Um, let's open it in a new tab. So now that you have a sense of the Coptic alphabet, and I, I highly recommend that you go back to this and um, you know take your best shot at reading what this says. There's lots of information out there about reading the Coptic alphabet, so you should be able to find plenty. Um, but yeah, try to make sure you know these letters pretty well, because once we get to this, uh, zoom in. In every case where I know the Coptic word, I'm going to put it in. So there are some cases where the word doesn't survive into Coptic, and I'm, I'm not going to try to guess at what it is, although that's generally pretty easy to do. In this class, I'm only going to give you certain information. Uh, so I'm just going to give you the, the known Coptic descendant of this late Egyptian word. So for instance, the word that we pronounce as Oped in Coptic is Ovt. And then you can use these two sources of information. So your uniliteral values and your Coptic values uh, to, fi to fill in the transcription. So for example, in this one, and get a transliteration keyboard, uh, this is I would write op-ed and you can see how I'm just transcribing literally the Egyptian um, Aleph PD, but if you should forget one of these values, um, you can't quite remember it, maybe the Coptic will help you figure it out. And even if that's not the case, having them both side by side is a really good idea because it's a good idea to learn these things simultaneously. Can we use MDC? Um, to transcribe as well. Peter, what do you mean? How would you use the MDC to transcribe? Oh, just in manual decodage. I, I probably slaughtered how you say that, actually. Uh, it would just be a capital A, a P, and a D. Um, mm. So. Oh, you I don't have to, yeah. Yeah, you could do it like MDC this. A, a ped. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, okay. That's actually pretty standard like practice in Egyptology to just to just use whichever one is most convenient. Uh, so there is a standard way of writing uh, Egyptian transcription using the just the ASCII alphabet. It's called um, Manuel de Codage is normally used specifically for um, for encoding hieroglyphic texts, and it has all of these formatting characters that allow you to to stack the hieroglyphic characters and stuff like that. Uh, but it's also a standard way of just writing the transcription using the ASCII alphabet because, you know, in the olden days, we didn't have all of these fancy keyboards um, that let you switch between different keyboards. Yeah, uh, Peter, that's perfectly fine. Anyone else, you're welcome to do it that way. I'll go ahead and put this one in since I'm here. Um, I'll put in both the um, proper transliteration and this, yeah. So yeah, either way, whichever one's easiest for you. Why there's an Aleph bird in thing. I remember it as just Het. Yes, you do. In Middle Egyptian, it's written Het uh, without the Aleph bird. For some reason in Late Egyptian, they start putting the Aleph bird on there. Why are they doing that? I don't know. Uh, maybe you'll be able to tell me, but I honestly have no idea. I'm guessing the word originally had a vowel, an initial vowel. And then in Late Egyptian, the Aleph bird has um, decidedly lost all of its prior consonantal value. So it's no longer a sort of velar R or velar L or whatever it is. Um, it is now just truly a kind of a blank character um, like, like Arabic Aleph where it was originally a glottal stop and now it's just kind of like it represents a long A vowel or it goes at the beginning of words or it's something for a Hamza to stand on when it truly is a glottal stop. It's, it's kind of, it, it kind of acquired this quality of like um, 
just like a placeholder character for like glottal stops and vowels and any like, I don't know what to write here kind of situation. So I'm guessing that the word was something like ache and, um, and then in Coptic, it, it even loses that initial vowel, which is really quite common and it just becomes he. So yeah, it's a good question though. Um, that's how it's written in late Egyptian. So yeah, might as well see it that way. And you got a bunch more stuff, a bunch more fun things to do. And we will go over all of these next time. So that's your homework is to um, try to write down the transcriptions of these things. I will call on volunteers to uh, give me the answers and I'll type them in. And um, yeah, we'll just talk about how they are, what they are. And hopefully some of you will get some of the answers wrong so we can dig into it and figure it out, figure out how you got confused. It's always good fun um, and strongly encouraged. You learn a lot by getting things wrong, or at least I do anyway. That's the only way I learn anything is by getting things wrong a few times. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, so that's all for today. Uh, you know your homework, it's in the syllabus. And um, I will see y'all next Saturday or, or sooner if you join the advanced students Patreon tier and come to the office hours. All right, have a good weekend, everyone. Have a good weekend.